If you actually Google this, you will discover that lots of people mangled the acronyms to make sure that they have something called the SMART Act. I was curious when I first when I first saw some of the search for it's like, why are they talking about this in Colorado in particular? How odd! This is somewhat obscure and not relevant to states yet. And then I looked at it and said, oh, that's because that's completely unrelated. It's a medical privacy act. Actually, I probably should have known about it. Um, so this this particular SMART Act is the SMART Copyright Act, and it's strengthening measures to advance rights technologies. I think it started with can spam when they really started torturing the words to come up with clever acronyms in this area. Can spam was about as bad as it got, um, but now they still do it because it's Washington. We're gonna have an acronym anyway, so let's make it say something that Back sounds good. Backronyms are a competitive sport in Congress. I, I kind of think that most yeah. of them should be called like the bloat acts or act or something like that, but they never pick those words. So this is Smart Act version number 508 because smarts are where they like and they can find words that start with the basic letters. But that's ours. Um, it amends parts of the existing Copyright Act in the um, Digital Millennium Copyright Act. I keep trying to get a dance started for the DMCA and it just doesn't pick up. I'm not as charismatic as the village people. Um, the Basically, the DMCA has been around long enough that we now see what works the way it was intended, what's been hijacked, and what just never got off the ground and worked at all. And that one of those sections that just never got off the ground and worked at all is one of them that this act is attaching. 512, one of the sections of this act, of the Digital Millennium Copyright Act, part of the Copyright Act, is um, was intended to bring together all of the different sides and they were supposed to form a broad consensus is the textual language about what sorts of technical measures should be taken to help protect content on the internet without over -bur unduly burdening the tech companies and at that point they were more even um, in parlance they were called internet service providers but they were the ones they're the platforms you know and if we're not putting the content up we can't afford to be liable for everything that someone else puts up because at the time there was no way at all to figure it out the tech just didn't exist yet. it was 98 wasn't it 98. Was past. so 98 it was I would say back in the dark ages but since I was a practicing lawyer that makes me feel even older than I am so um, but obviously tech has come a little bit of a ways since then and basically the idea was we need to have a provision so that we can allow tech measures to be adopted uniformly as something to protect content, but in a way that isn't going to be unduly burdensome. Of course, if you're one of the tech companies, you're thinking, hmm, well right now there's no requirement that I use any sort of technical measures to protect other people's content that's on our um, platform, and I kind of like it that way. Whether you're going about it with the intention of supporting piracy or not, it doesn't matter if you're the one putting up all the content or you know, allowing other people to post their content on your platform, the fewer legal things you are required to do, the better. Whether you choose to use some measures or not, it's kind of up to you, but no one wants to be required to do stuff by the government, especially if, as it says in 512, the general safe harbor that was given to the tech companies um, being basically, if you follow all of our rules and you do the little takedown dance and all of those things that we say, then you will not be liable for anything that someone posts on your site. And that was an important compromise at the time because no one knew the rules yet because there weren't any. When it was being argued in Congress and discussed in the academic halls, I was in those academic halls, and they liked to talk about, you know, equating it to the phone companies because lawyers well, now and then, tend not to always be on the bleeding edge of tech. So we like to analogize to things that we understand, and we say that we do it so that everyone can understand the example. Yeah, so we know what we're talking about. But in 98, it was analogized to phone companies. We all knew what phones were. At the time, they were mostly attached to the wall. Some of us had them and said, ooh, this is great, it's a cell phone, which I keep in my glove box in case I ever need it for an emergency, because you know, it costs like $50 a minute to use and no one thought that they would do it when they were driving and all it did was talk so um, they said well just like AT&T or Bell is not liable for what people say on their phone lines this is very similar and at the time most of what was being posted was on bulletin boards 
So people were posting all kinds of stuff, and a lot of it was academics talking back and forth. And you know once we get talking, whether it's online or in person, we don't shut up ever. So the companies couldn't possibly read through everything being posted. So it was thought that this is a reasonable balance, and it makes sense because it's just like a phone, and we understand that. Can I actually hop in a little bit with the political background on this? Yeah. So, so I come at this from the perspective of a consumer advocate. I will not say how old I was in 1998 uh, for fear of starting a civil war. Um, having, having said that, um, yeah, so, so when we talk about the DMCA, it, there's a lot of different parts to it, and I think people kind of lose sight of that. The two salient parts that most people think of when they think of the DMCA are Section 1201, which is the section that basically enshrines DRM as legally binding. So that's the section that says you cannot crack DRM to get at an underlying copyrighted work, which is usually software or a movie or something like that. That's 1201. Uh, uh, you know, that was considered uh, a gift to content folks. All cop the history of copyright in the 20th century is all about horse trading. All it is literally just, I'll give you this and you get that. Um, which kind of works fine politically, it doesn't work great on a policy level because you end up with behemoths like modern American copyright law, which is just a disaster. If this is interesting to anyone, go look up Jessica Littman. She's a professor at the University of Michigan. She wrote a book called Digital Copyright it tracks the entire history of copyright in the 20th century. It is free online under Creative Commons. Like, nice. go read your Littman. Um, she's wonderful. But she chronicles how this is, it's, it, the whole history of copyright in the 20th century is, we have two established industries. They shake hands. They get along. Somebody new comes in and eats everyone's lunch. Then they get mad about it. They have hearings in Congress. They yell at the new guy. And then they sit down and they start negotiating a new copyright act. And then 20 years later, they finally agree on a new copyright act. And then as soon as the ink is dry, some other new upstart comes in and eats everyone's lunch. And the process just repeats itself over and over again. Uh, which is how we got with, this is how we ended up with the DMCA. So the two big parts are 1201, which is like DRM is basically law. Um, and the other is section 512, which is the safe harbor provisions, which basically say that if you are a platform, and somebody uploads uh, copyright infringing material onto your platform. If you follow certain rules, which is notice and takedown, which is the one everyone is most familiar with, is sort of the, the, the very familiar part of it, um, then you are not liable uh, as a platform. So if I run a platform, Courtney uploads uh, the Dolly Parton discography uh, without the rights to it, and I get a notice from, from the Dolly Parton, uh, folks, I have to take it down under a notice. There's a procedure that is very vaguely laid out in the statute. If she sent the letter to you, it would be very politely worded. It would be very nice. Um, and and I'd have her might, sign it. And I'd she might it. include you know, a free CD or something. Exactly. Um, so that's 512. Part of 512 that was written into this was part of this safe harbor was contingent, like Courtney said, on using standard technical measures. You had to comply with whatever the standard technical measures were that had been developed. And again, this was written in 1998. The there were none. There were none. The idea was that tech and content would come around and they'd hold hands and they'd sing kumbaya and they would come up with a hey, magical I have consensus. Sing kumbaya written in my notes. Ha. Um, <laughs> Simpatico. We are agreeing. <laughs> this might be one of the only things. Yeah. Um, we agree on that. It's like, oh, that's cute. You think they're all going to sit down and suddenly agree? Oh, that's cute. And you know, to be fair, you don't get out much, do you? It's 1998. They, they, Genuinely, they, couldn't, they couldn't have done. Yeah. They couldn't have done technical measures that they wanted to. The tech they was not any. there, and so they, it was almost what we in the contract world call an agreement to agree. They said we will need to have a broad agreement on this, and so as soon as there is a broad agreement on this, we're going to make it enforceable. Yes, you so, can guess what happened. So it never happened. Um, and because it never happened, there's never been any functionally platforms that have ever been required to follow standard technical measures because they don't exist. Um, and now we have sort of big platforms that have a lot more negotiating power, and you know their position is like, well, we, we don't want to. We don't want it. Uh, we'll do what we want to do. Shut up. So go away. Way, we know what um, you were talking about last night. And smaller and smaller platforms. Meanwhile, so like I work a lot with Organization for Transformative Works, the folks who run Archive of Our Own, and they're just like. I, I don't even know what this would look like for us. <laughs> like, we host fan fiction that is mostly text-based. I truly do not know what you would want us to do for this. Um, so you have a much more sort of, not only has the tech gotten more complicated, but the kinds of content has blossomed. And so you have a lot of different sized actors, you have a lot of different kinds of copyrighted content. So content folks have been infinitely frustrated by this. 
Um, and when I say content folks, the, the three big ones that usually are at the forefront of this are the music industry, um, they are the canary in the coal mine for a lot of this stuff, because music files comparatively are relatively small and they were sort of easy to share. So you had Napster and they ended up being sort of the first ones to have to really grapple with this. Um, the movie industry uh, and photographers. Um, photographers, are, I think, arguably have the hardest. They tend to be small independent businesses um, and photos are super easy to share. Um, and so they have had a very hard time of it, and they're frustrated, and they're like, well, these standard technical measures need to exist. Now, they kind of do. Standard technical measures, the closest that exists in the wild to what a standard technical measure would look like, as envisioned by content folks, is YouTube's content ID. Um, now, YouTube's content ID is proprietary, and they're not sharing it with anyone. Part of the requirement for a standard technical measure is it needs to be available to everyone on fair, reasonable, and non-discriminatory terms. Content ID is not that. Content ID is proprietary, they've invested millions of dollars in building it, and it still sucks. Um, it is still very, very bad at its job. But they're um, not going to share it with anyone. And they're super not going to share it with anyone, but that is the cutting edge technology of what standard technical measures looks like is content ID. Um, so this is, this is kind of where we find ourselves. You have content folks getting agitated that this is, because they would like a system to be able, in an ideal world, to be able, that, so that everyone will have a system where a thing gets uploaded and some computer somewhere will be like, oh, that's, that's the audio recording of Jolene, or that's the photograph that Mark McKenna took, or that is, you know, and they'll be able to be identified easily and quickly. And from there you can track it and there's all other kinds of like policy outcomes of this that content folks would prefer to happen, um, which I'm not going to get into, but uh, basically this is like the world they would like to see. Um, and it's a, technically it's a very difficult world to implement, and also you have this sort of unwilling, like the big tech giants are like, well, we, just, we would rather not. Um, so enter the Smart Act. Uh, Tom Tillis, Senator from North Carolina, is the ranking member of the IP subcommittee on the Senate Judiciary, which does not sound like a sexy post because it is not. Um, it is a deeply yeah, unsexy. So it's sexy. Um, well, it's, he's mostly on it because of the research triangle in North Carolina. He's like a patent guy. That's that's kind of why he got the the seat. So it's not like there's a Hollywood in North Carolina. He's just he's mostly there for the patents, but the copyright stuff comes up as well. Now he's also co-sponsoring with Leahy from Vermont. So it's not just a Republican plot. It's a bipartisan bill because Leahy's fairly lefty. So the two of them coming together is something that makes people look and say, oh, well, Leahy. wait, this may not be. A bad idea because there's just one or the other of them. Half of the Senate has to say no. That's horrible. Late, late he is also a very, very big fan of Hollywood. Um, so this is the thing about like uh, copyright is it has a it doesn't cut party lines like you'd expect it to. It is very and I say this as a consumer advocate who a good portion of my job is arguing against more expansive copyright laws. Um, I represent the people it, on the other side most of the time, so yep, we so, have different views on whether piracy is okay. <laughs> I'm gonna let that bait slide. Uh, the uh, I think we have different definitions of what piracy is. is the issue. Um, so yeah, so Leahy is a big fan of Hollywood. If you've ever watched any of the Batman movies, he is in all of them. He cameos in like literally every Batman movie I think that has ever been made. And it's um, not because that he's particularly fun to look at or has any acting skills. No, he don't, he loves movies. He loves movies. He loves the motion picture industry. This makes my job very hard. Um, I gotta say, if I were a senator, I might I, be in movies too. I would pull that lever like crazy. If they handed me a button that said, get me in a Batman movie, I'd be slamming it every day. I mean, I wouldn't be um, taking huge bribes, but I can be in a movie. Yeah. I'd be in a lot of movies. You would recognize me. And I'd be nicer to those guys uh, if it got me in movies. Um, so, so this is sort of the context in which it comes up. Now, to, to zoom out a little bit, standard technical measures is a very deliberately very vague phrase. And this was, I will give kudos to Congress in a rare moment, I will say, look, they knew that they didn't know what these would look like. And they knew that they were trying to some degree to future-proof this legislation. So they were just like, whatever it is, so long as everyone agrees to it and it's accessible and da 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 da, then that's fine. So, standard technical measures as a concept can mean almost anything. Whatever they all agree it's going to mean. And but which, that was the best they could define it in 98. And frankly, right. I don't think they do much better now. Right. The and one so, thing that they added that I don't think 
um, anyone is upset about, correct me if I'm wrong, is the they're also changing a little bit of um, 512 to say when we're talking about the old school stuff that was supposed to be agreed to in that nice hip, happy hippie circle of kumbaya, um, they've changed one thing in it to say that it's okay if it doesn't actually apply to everyone on the internet. It's okay if you have some targeted ones for different types of players because the way that it was written originally, the internet was very small. And they said, okay, everyone should play by the same rules. Well, now, one thing I think everyone agrees on who is um, at the table arguing about it is that, okay, what might make a whole lot of sense for YouTube is not going to make a lot of sense for a real small player. So it's okay if you have measures that really apply only to the big guys, or only to the little guys, or mm -hmm. the middle guys, or then we could fragment that. But right. So that's kind of a clarification language. Now, I don't think that's I don't up, upsets anyone. I think does anyone's it? Been, well, it upsets some of the content folks a little bit, but they would like to see more uniform measures. But th the point of all of this is that standard technical measures can mean a lot of different things. Um, so for example, which means, you know, as a concept, it, so again, I work for a consumer advocacy organization. We generally have almost never met a copyright bill that we liked, um, and including the actual including Act. Smart Act, um, the Burn Convention. Um, <laughs> yeah. So, having said that, standard technical measures. There's a a standard technical measure could be um, one thing that we've worked on a lot is improving the search function of the registration at the copyright office to allow like reverse image search. You should be able to log into the copyright office's website, upload an image like you do to Google Images. It should search the database, give you a bunch of hits, and tell you who the rights holder is. That is a thing they should be able to do. Um, they are arguably working towards that. Said, they're still working towards doing it that. It is taking a very long time. Unlike trademarks and patents, there's not actually a threshold search for your copyrighted materials. They don't look to see if anyone else has done this already. They in part because under copyright law, just because someone else did it doesn't mean you can't. Right. I can take just the same picture that Ansel Adams did. Okay, really, I can't. But if I had any, try. if I had talent, I could go to the same place and shoot the same hills and discover that, yeah, he did more than that, didn't he? Um, he probably didn't use the green box setting on his camera, but. So just because it exists doesn't mean you can't copyright it, because if you independently created it, you have a legitimate so, copyright in it. So there's no search, there's no reviewing attorney in the copyright office to check to see if it's okay to copyright Somebody did it, did it yourself. Yeah. Um, so that's, that actually touches on two things. So one is that you know there are very low, what we see is very non-intrusive definitions of standard technical measures, um, which would be something like modernizing the copyright office. Keep in mind, the copyright office's records are still almost entirely on paper. Okay, they are the copyright office, and this is the second part of, of what's relevant. The way the copyright office is structured, currently the copyright office sits within the Library of Congress. Um, and it is, a, it, for reasons that make sense historically, um, because they were the folks, when you still had to register your work to get a copyright, which you don't anymore, um, you have to register it to get some very important benefits, um, but you still just get a copyright regardless of whether you sent your manuscript in. Um, you know, when you had to register to get a copyright, they were the guys who took it and like gave it the little stamp that said this is now copyrighted, and you put a copy in the Library of Congress. That's how they got their main collection. Aside yeah. from what Jefferson left when he went bankrupt and died, they also, um, said, if you want a copyright, you have to send us a copy. Now, and when much else? And so, and this is, you know, it, it's got a dual role. One, it still does the registration. They're also policy advisors. And this gets a little tense. So the Library of Congress, and this is where we're going to zoom back in a little micro-con law lesson here. The, there's three branches of the government. We're going to go full schoolhouse rock here. Um, there's the executive branch, which is where most of the agencies and acronyms that you have heard of exist. Um, like, independent agencies are sort of lumped under the executive branch for most legal purposes. So that's the Department of Justice, that's the FCC as an independent agency, that's the FTC, that's the, 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 the NTIA, the FBI, um, Department of Housing, Education, da 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 That's all executive branch. You have the legislative branch, which is Congress. Um, and the Library of Congress, and also the Copyright Office. Uh, and then you've got the Judicial Branch. Now, the trick is, um, all of the laws that we have that are, exist to sort of check rulemaking done by the government, 
Uh, so things like the Administrative Procedure Act. If you're a lawyer, you become, you're very good friends with the APA uh, after a certain point. Um, the Administrative Procedure Act puts guardrails on how the government can make rules. It's this idea that like law should be coming from Congress, right? Because that's how we set this up. So Congress should make the laws. Well, nowadays we have a very complicated society and a very complicated like state apparatus to come up with that. And so you have executive branch agencies that are issuing regulations all the time. And, you know, you don't, as a practical matter, I don't want Congress doing some of this on their own. <laughs> like, first off, that would take forever. Um, the rules would be even dumber, arguably, than they really are. Um, and it would just be a whole mess. So for nimbleness and expertise and a whole bunch of other reasons, we have these executive branch agencies making rules. And as a result, we have put uh, laws in place that give them guardrails, you know, to check the power, to allow people to come in and sue and say you did this wrong. There's some kind of accountability baked in through these other laws. Most now, of those have been disregarded in the past couple of years. Yeah, well, we also we stress tested the limits of most of those in the last administration. Um, Just this one, yeah. Yep, and so and all administrations tend. Yeah. Let's we can all agree. They if, all if you do have power, this. you try to get more. Um, the 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 sort of snag on this is that none of these laws apply to Congress. Congress Congress's motto is, I do what I want. Um, Congress is not uh, subject to basic employment laws. Uh, Congress is not subject to anti-discrimination laws. Congress can do what it wants. There is no check on Congress and any of its functions. That includes the Library of Congress, because it's part of the legislative branch. That includes the Copyright Office. The Copyright Office, despite the fact that it can actually make law, because it does, it makes law every three years in the 1201 rulemaking process, uh, where it gets to decide who's allowed to break DRM legally and who isn't. The official, and this is being tested right now in court, um, the official position of the Copyright Office is because of where we sit, we sit within the Library of Congress, you cannot sue us for anything. You cannot sue us for the, under the APA, you cannot sue us under constitutional violation, we are basically Congress, therefore we are immune. Um, they have held this position for about a decade, which is about how long they've been sued over this yeah. many, many times. So this is a problem. Um, this is an accountability problem. If you're a tech person like me, this is a whole lot of problems. Um, they're basically unreviewable by courts in their estimation. So enter the SMART Act. The SMART Act comes, looks at this problem of standard technical measures and says, you know, nobody's doing this voluntarily. So what we need to do is we need to have the government force them to do it. Like, we need to force everybody to sit down around a table and come up with something. And the way that we're going to do that is we're going to have the Copyright Office, every three years, basically have a hearing, go back into a room, and then come out and announce, this is the new standard technical measure, you must all abide by it. Um, and if you do not abide by it, insert varying degrees of liability for various things here. Um, you could probably tell by the way I framed that that I think this is a bad idea. <laughs> Um, especially because the Copyright Office does not have technical, it doesn't have tech expertise. It, neither does Congress. Neither does Congress. not making any difference here as to who's going to make yeah. a law. The technicians don't know what they're doing. No, they don't. Of and course not. <laughs> and the Copyright Office will be no better or no worse, but Congress has the authority to pass this law, and the Copyright Office had, you know, if they're appointed to make that decision, that's not any different than how the rest of government functions. There are right. no tech experts anywhere in it. Doesn't stop the laws from coming. No, but in this case, Copyright Act. In this um, case, the the you know, and this is an inherent tension. Whenever you have rulemaking anywhere in an administrative agency, is that you have this problem called capture, which is you are designed as an agency to really deal with kind of one set of issues and maybe one, maybe two industries. I also work a lot with the FCC, which you know, for all of its faults, the FCC has actually gotten pretty good at dealing with a very broad spectrum, no pun intended, um, of folks like, you know, uh, tech companies and cable companies and broadband ISPs, radio companies, they have to deal with the Department of Defense, God bless them. Um, the Department of Defense owns a lot of spectrum. Uh, and so they've kind of gotten nimble about this. The Copyright Office has gotten better in recent years, but they still fundamentally are an, uh, an office where their mandate is copyright. And they have historically viewed their industries that they talk about as copyright industries. And everybody else is kind of secondary in their, in their approximation of this. So historically, when they have gone back and done studies, it'd be like, should we do this new copyright thing? The answer that they have come up with in, a, in a, uh, you know, the studies, they see themselves as advocating for copyrighted industries. So they'll come out and say, yes, more copyright. 
um, like these industries need it to survive. So there, and it has gotten better. Again, I will caveat this. It, there's a lot of internal culture change at the Copyright Office in the last few years. They have gotten to be a lot more sort of, I would say considerate. Um, a lot of people would probably say that it's all gone downhill. Um, but they've also been improving their technical abilities and baked into the of the sections of this act are some requirements that they actually intentionally expand into um, areas where they will understand that like they have to hire people and actually have tech friendly, tech savvy people in the areas that are going to be administering this law if it passes, which is way a long time. It's a whole but separate question. That, yeah. But the um, the lack of technical expertise is first off not unique in the government and is something that is addressed specifically saying we're going to do the best we can, we're the government, have low expectations, of getting technical people in here to be part of this new process. So the fact that they're not good at it now does not mean they won't be better at it if this were to pass. Correct. But again, you still have the issue that we get hung up on, which is you got to be able to sue if they get it wrong. Um, That's in there also. Yeah, but I'm under the APA. You have an absolute right under the new act to sue in the federal circuit. For... The, for the, the STMs? Yeah. Mm, I'm still skeptical. It's, um, it's in there in words that the, non-litigators can read. The other... <laughs> I'm not a litigator, so when we get into some of the weeds of what exactly does that mean in the court, it, you know, for, how does that impact your experience in the courtroom? Like, oh, I don't know. Yeah. You know call it um, a litigator. But um, it, it is in there very clear that there, that's one of the critiques that were made of the original draft, mm -hmm. and a couple of things were done to change it. Originally, we, we've jumped ahead to kind of the... Um, some of the argument parts of it, but the original part of the SMART Act had all of these new requirements um, tucked up into the old requirements, which meant that if you screw this up, you lose your safe harbor. That's huge. And that's dangerous. They said, look, what if we goofed and we're going to lose all of our liability of protection? We can't afford that. That's a reasonable problem. They took it out of that section, put it into a separate section, so even if you screw up compliance, you don't lose your safe harbor as a tech company. And that, the other thing that they did that was in response to comments from the tech side was that they added specifically an appeal because they, I mean, she's exactly right. You don't have the standard rights to appeal and complain and things in, that you would from a tech, from a traditional federal or executive branch agency, so they put most of them in. They said, okay, well, they now have a rulemaking process, a comment process, an objection process, similar to, I mean, I can't tell you how similar because that's beyond the details I know, but it was designed to be equivalent to the same procedure in the executive branch, and it also specifically gives people who object to the decisions made under this new process the right to sue in the federal court. So those complaints have been addressed by the um, people pushing the act. So, so there's a couple of things here that I'm going to throw out. One is just the political reality of, and this is just, I'm, I'm a hill beast. I'm technically a registered lobbyist, I think, for like three more weeks. Well, let's, give them, um, um, let's give them the little short summary of what the new section is, because they won't understand the difference of the two things you talk about. The old version, we said, was the um, technical measures that everyone was supposed to agree on. Yeah, that's cute. I don't think we can get everyone in this room to agree on them. And, were probably more closely aligned than the people who were supposed to be coming to a broad consensus. So nothing happened under the old act. Seriously, 20-something years, this many things have come out under it. So we talk about giving it more teeth, letting them do it. The teeth that are being put into this one, which is now a separate section so it doesn't destroy your safe harbor protections, is that every three years the Library of Congress is going to figure out what technical measures should be required. And it's supposed to be after everyone sits at the table and sings kumbaya or throws things at each other, whatever happens. And the Library of Congress is supposed to take into account what everyone says and come up with a good answer. That's where I start to have problems. That smells a little bit like I'm from the government, I'm here to help. But the idea behind it is that ain't working. You need someone driving the process. Well, let's put the Copyright Office in charge to drive the process. That seems appropriate. Uh, you know. We could put Google in charge of it, but that seems wrong somehow. So we'll put the Library of Congress in charge and give them just enough power to be able to make people come to the table because they'll know that there will be a result rather than there'll be no result. And the Library of Congress is supposed to be trusted to come up with a good answer after taking input from all of the relevant players. And again, they've baked in 
the appeals process and the other protections that you're supposed to have from a rulemaking agency. So that was kind of the idea, was we got to add teeth because this was supposed to happen. Congress passed it. Nothing ever happened. So let's update it. And every three years, the Library of Congress can come up, can tell us what people have to do. That's a broad grant, even in my mind. And trusting them to come up with the right answer, eh. But that's more of a federalist issue to me than an IP issue. Yeah, so um, I'll, I'll but, that, but so that's a separate section. That's what we're kind of talking yeah, about now. So We've the, shifted. The, the political reality of this, um, and I'll, I'll be relative, because I do want to leave some time for questions, because I know this is like an absolute thicket of stuff. I mean, we've been just going nonstop, and this is only two thirds of our panel. <laughs> like, we're still just going about it. Actually, TJ um, has pacing. There you go. Um, not he, here. He partied too hard with the stonecutters last night, I'm pretty sure is the answer. I mean, as we were walking in thinking, normally I don't think of 10 a.m. as the crack of dawn, and yet today I do. Um, um, so the, the so political... next time you see him on a panel, harass... Oh, wait, today's his last panel, isn't it? I think so. Oh, man. Well, it's, if you, you know, see him in the hallway, give him crap. He's here tonight. Hacking 201. Oh, okay. Um, so shit. He needs it. Speaking as a consumer advocate, the, here's sort of how the political reality of these things tends to go. Um, for one thing, like I am involved in a lot of discussions around a lot of issues that involve, to, frank, to be frank, tech mandates. Uh, ideas of like, you must now implement this new technology to do this specific thing. Um, a lot of them are copyright related. So like the conversation around site blocking always comes up with this. What's like, well, you know, uh, they do it in Europe and it hasn't broken the internet. It's like, well, that's actually wrong for a bunch of reasons specific to the way that they do it in Europe. Um, but the people who come and make this argument are vendors. They are companies who sell the technology that does dynamic DNS lookup and dynamic IP blocking. And they roll up to Congress and they're like, well, we're doing it in Europe and it's fine. So you should start doing it here. So a lot of the policy conversation is being driven by vendors right now who like, are literally using politics as a sales pitch for their own stuff. It's like pharmaceutical companies that have a drug, that, well, it didn't do what we wanted to, but hey, we could call this a disease and this cures it. And so they convince the medical community this is a problem and we have the drug to solve it. Now let's sell our drug. It's sort of some of the same thing. The vendors yeah. say, I have this great piece of software. So this is not- Let me cause a problem. This is not new or unique to tech. It is, however, still a bad thing. Um, and especially when you have folks pitching, I have a whole separate can rant about um, staff level expertise in Congress, which is they don't pay people enough and so no one stays there more than a year or two. Um, and they're and all in their early 20s. And they're all in their early 20s because you get paid, no joke, $30,000 a year to work for a member of Congress. And, and free that does not is a substantial part of your salary. Yeah, it does not even cover rent in a DC suburb. Um, some of them sleep in the office. Yeah. Um, so anyway, so you have vendors are the ones driving these conversations, coming in and saying, I can do it, my shiny product can do it. Look, first off, their shiny product can't do it, all right? <laughs> like in nine out of 10 cases, their shiny product does not do anything close to what they say it does. Um, but they come in with a razzle dazzle and it's a, it's a sales pitch and now I have to deal with calls from members of Congress saying, well, why can't we just do dynamic IP site blocking? For lots of reasons. I saw the um, ad on TV, now I want it. Yeah, exactly. So <laughs> this is gonna be that again. Um, so this is the same problem. We where agree on this. You're going to have vendors coming in and saying, I have this new shiny content monitoring technology, and it's on the blockchain. Don't get me started on the blockchain. Um, and <laughs> and lots of other buzzwords. solve words. it with crypto, throw you in a volcano. Um, wait, 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 but it's in the cloud. It's an NFT. Where NFTs are going to solve copyright. Please, please um, <laughs> the... Uh, <laughs> So the so that's one problem. The other problem is speaking as a consumer advocate, we do the 1201 process every three years, which is this is to rewind a little bit. 1201 is the part of the law that enshrines DRM. Every three years, the Copyright Office will hold hearings, and you, as a consumer advocate or a disability advocate or whatever, get to have to have to roll up to the Copyright Office and say, please. Copyright Office, allow me to be allowed to break this DRM without breaking the law. Um, I represent blind people who need to be able to use screen readers. Um, please let us break the DRM. And you have to do this every three years. Um, and the folks who have to do it are the user community. So this is how I and a colleague spent 
I don't even know how many hours over the course of 18 months because it's every three years, which functionally means it's an 18 month cycle of 18 months off and then another 18 months revving up for the next set of decisions. Um, arguing about why you should be allowed to take your old optical drive out of your Xbox and put in a new one. Um, this is incredibly stupid. This is stupid on a lot of levels, but it is incredibly taxing in terms of time, in terms of resources, and it is taxing on the groups that can least afford it. Um, it is taxing on disability groups. Literally, there's one guy, Blake Reed, he teaches at Colorado University. Um, Blake is the guy who represents the disability community, which is a phrase that actually doesn't mean anything because that's a huge freaking community. That's like saying representing the female community. Like, it's, that's an umbrella that's so big you can't even see it anymore. Um, and it's just him. And if Blake got hit by a bus, they'd be out an advocate. And he's a professor, so he's salaried, so he does this with his clinic students, because he has clinic students, which are basically unpaid slave labor of law students. And he's like, we're gonna represent blind people. Get cracking. Um, that is the backbone infrastructure on which consumer advocacy works. It is extremely precarious. It is underfunded. And it barely eats by by the skin of its teeth every year. Um, and now you're asking to do this and to put folks like me in a room against tech vendors who say, my product works. And if we say, well, how does it work? They'll say, well, it's a trade secret. We can't tell you. And even if you got them to explain to the copyright office, copyright office isn't going to be able to tell what, what this is and what it isn't. Um, and the content folks are all going to be backing it up saying like, yeah, 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 that's fine. His stuff works. Go for it. Um, it's an, and there's some of this is just, a lot of this is a systemic problem with consumer advocacy and user advocacy and non-industry advocacy within the system. Like, and this is, I'm not expecting this to solve it. Having said that, the number of people, so like I joke that I got to be an expert in music copyright in 2018 because there was a big bill about music copyright that worked way through Congress and we worked on it and we actually got the stuff that concerned us mostly fixed and there was some good stuff that came out of it. It was actually a copyright bill oh. that we were fine with. So sometimes the system works. Occasionally, um, okay. but Just literally, to make sure we saw that. Literally, the entirety of people working. So the reason there is a public domain in sound recordings now is sitting right here. <laughs> One person. I'm gonna toot my own horn until I die on this. Um, it is literally. It was me. It was 60 hours a week of me yelling at people. Um, and I had a one-year-old at that point, like, shoot me with a gun, I was so stressed. Yeah, um, came naturally. Yeah, exactly. Um, I was so stressed I didn't even notice it anymore. <laughs> um, but like, that was, that was, we had us and we had one sympathetic senator, Ron Wyden, who was willing to put a hold on this bill until we got it fixed. Um, and that's, it is truly skin of our teeth to get some of this stuff done. Um, and to put any, to, to compound onto that in a situation where as a consumer advocate, I am both out, outgunned financially, I am outgunned in terms of manpower, and I am juggling the entire copyright portfolio for my organization. Um, I, it literally, this is my IP team right here. Um, and we are outgunned in technical expertise. I was an English major. <laughs> this is, don't try to explain code to me sometimes. I'm just gonna glaze over. Um, you know, and frankly, like, we, we don't have the time or the manpower or the, a lot of times, the technical expertise well, to be able to get in there and deal with that. back to the session that we are talking about a little bit. Yeah. Because, I mean, what she is saying about the system is absolutely correct, and you're on it in a level that I'm not. However, the system is what it is, and I don't think it's perhaps the right argument to make to say that because the little guys don't have sufficient representation, we should not act to do the things that Congress is supposed to do. The Constitution mandates copyright protection. Doesn't say how, doesn't say how much, doesn't say how long, but it says it has to be there. Congress should be acting in this way to protect the content creators. And this does not just mean Disney, this means someone writing their first novel. This means the photographer who's hoping to sell a picture one day. This means little people as well, and so you have unrepresented small guys on the content side. And they get ignored because it's fun to make fun of the mouse and to vilify the mouse. It's not just the mouse. It's everyone else who wants to sell content and create content and be creative and have that creation and that creativity rewarded as it's supposed to be according to the Constitution and the law. Digital obviously makes it easier to steal stuff. And this is, this is maybe not the best way to do it, but 
nothing Congress comes up with is the best way because it's something that everyone had to agree on. Well, you're never going to get what I think is right if I have to agree with someone else. Generally, if all the sides are a little bit unhappy with it, it's probably as good as you're going to get. But the idea that some people will, dis will be disadvantaged or some people will not have been represented fully in the process is not a reason to either not act at all or to screw over the people on the other end of the equation who also weren't represented because so, the small guys never are. So this Protecting is, content isn't evil. So this is, I, I agree with this. So to zoom out, the, the thing about policy, just as a general matter, and this is me getting philosophical, um, is it's a question of trade-offs. You're going to have a system, everything you do has a ripple somewhere. When we're talking about the internet, that ripple affects literally everyone. Um, we are constant, and this is a, a this is a struggle that copyright policy has only very recently come to terms with, which is copyright policy until very recently was industry to industry policy, um, and it, it, it left out small creators. Like I will be the first one to tell you that. But it was generally crafted as here's how we set the rules of interaction for licensing, with the assumption that everyone involved is some kind of corporate entity. Um, and that largely kind of sort of maybe held and then Xeroxes came along and then it started to break down a little bit and then we had the internet. And now literally every single one of us, every single time we look at our phone, every time we use anything involving software, right now because I'm being recorded in some kind of digital format, I am interacting with copyright law. Um, it is just an inescapable part of our daily lives. So now you've got major corporate actors and then you have the, you know, however many millions of people just use the internet every day. So changes of copyright policy do affect everybody. And so the question that you've got to ask, and I think this is where reasonable people will disagree, um, whenever you impose a new regulation around copyright, what are the effects on the entire system? What are the downstream effects? And so the thing that I've kind of been dancing around here a little bit is because standard technical measures, remember, to go back to how I said it can mean a lot of things. Um, what content, major content companies would like it to mean, and they're very open about this, if you ask them, is they would like mandatory upload filters. They would like a system where every website that you can possibly upload content onto will screen everything as you're uploading it, determine by algorithm whether they think it's infringing a copyright or not, and if you aren't, allowed, if you aren't officially given a check mark or a special user or whatever, it has to stay down. They'll just like spit it back out at you. Um, that doesn't mean that they're writing the law. That's what they would like. It's pretty extreme. That's but what the folks at the other end of the spectrum would like to say, everything's fair use, nothing's protected, it's fair, go do it. And that's not a good policy either. So you have very extreme policies that whether this act is the right way to balance it is an interesting question, but the act actually does take active and express steps to try to say, we're going to listen to all of the different theories and the different, this is what we should do and the different approaches and hopefully find one that is the least burdensome and the most effective. So without destroying the internet, we will protect content a little better. And that's what we're, what Congress is hoping to find. That's what the Tillis Leahy thing here is intending to do. And they honestly have taken a lot of very express steps to try to um, lessen the burden even from the way they're phrasing it. So the, but I, they don't say, as you point out, they don't tell us what those measures are going to be because they don't know. They don't know what they would be yet because you still can't do it. So I will say the, the sort of second half of that thought, which is, you know, uh, one, this goes back to, again, you've got folks like me and my colleagues who are trying to represent the voice of literally everybody in the U.S. who is not, or, or some of us are rights holders. I'm a rights holder. Um, I own the rights to many things. Uh, I own the rights to very few things. Nobody will publish my fiction, sorry. Um, having said that, you, again, you're looking at the, system, the possible systemic costs. So right now, what this act does is it sets up a process in which 
um, which is structurally favoring one side of the equation. I don't very, think that's uh, true. Pretty heavily. It, no. Well, it's definitely disfavoring our side of the equation. The tech companies um, have a big seat at that and, table. And the tech companies do not represent consumers. This is a Venn diagram that is completely split in the last decade. Um, occasionally, we still get along with them. I spend as much time of my day yelling at and like screaming at Amazon and Google as I do talking to them politely. Good. Um, which we should. And these but are both not. Are in, both have the shared interest of less requirements and less regulation? Not necessarily. Oh, I think we're supposed to have um, questions. Yeah, so the, the Google has an interest of not getting sued. That's that's their interest at the end of the day. Uh, that is not necessarily the protection of their users. That is not necessarily the protection of speech. Oh, I think um, they're and, able, don't get me wrong, but I the, think in this case the interests are shared. And, um, Having said that, it's, yeah, so it's complicated, um, and there's a lot of potential downstream risk of if this process breaks bad, the consequences of that are immense. Um, and that's not a risk that I don't think any of us are comfortable with, which is why my colleague just wrote a paper called Consensus.Command. Uh, you can scan the QR code and pull it up. Um, but basically is arguing for like a consensus-driven approach that is not the the Library of Congress We've had coming forward. It's a consensus and... driven approach since 1998, and there has been exactly zero progress. So, consensus isn't ever going to work. You have to have someone driving. Because the we discovered that when we founded the country, Articles of Confederation didn't work, Constitution did. It's the same concept. Someone's got to drive. Because the text still isn't there. Content ID sucks. Now, keep in mind, and it's Congress the best is, thing we got. <laughs> the Library of Congress is not <laughs> mandated to pick technology every three years. That's how often they'll do their official rulemaking process like they always do. If they look at it and say, you know, we heard everyone and nothing still is going to do it, they can do nothing. And I think they're probably good at that. This but is, we are supposed to do questions. This is the point where I'll open it up to questions by putting the dunce hat on my head. So, continue. How is uh, the proliferation of foreign tech companies, name, uh, namely TikTok, really directly affected the uh, speed of policy making around, uh, around digital uh, copyright? That's a good question. That's a you question. It's TikTok has mostly come up in privacy uh, discussions. I have not seen it as much in copyright. Um, you know, the the old complaint specifically about China is that China is very slow to respond to American copyright claims. I think they have gotten better about it, but better I don't is not know. To with good. Yeah, it's a very low bar. Um, so you know, international obligations sort of being what they are and always being very complicated. Um, I I don't know that TikTok specifically has driven much of the copyright conversation. Um, the ones that have driven it are like Twitch. Um, Twitch and Amazon and Twitch being bought by Amazon and um, anything, Twitch in specifically comes out of, you know, streaming is fundamentally a fan activity and fans have a, a what I like to call folk copyright, which is this idea of like, here's the norms around how we use stuff. Um, it doesn't actually map to direct copyright law. I think in a lot of places it makes more sense than actual copyright law does. Like the right of attribution is the big thing in folk copyright, which we don't have a right for in statutory law most of the time. Um, but that's where you have like these sort of big fan-oriented, use-oriented, like just we build this around users, and then at some point the rubber meets the road, and we actually have to like reconcile these two ideas. So it's that tends to be from copyright. a legal standpoint, though, because copyright law flows down from the Constitution, which is giving creators rights to control their creations. And so that's where the law starts from because that's where the Constitution says it has to. It's not supposed to start with what the users want and flow back to the artists. It's required to start with giving the artists a limited monopoly. Now there's a lot of argument over how limited that monopoly should be, but the law is supposed to and does flow the other direction. That's not a bug, that's a feature. So when I go to write lovely Don Bacon and Sass and Fisher of Nebraska, what are, from each of you, what are like the two points that I should make when they say, hey, when this comes up, these are the questions you should be asking? That's a good question. Honestly, before I wrote to a senator, I would wait for the final draft because, that, like I said, they recently do you know the date of the recent changes? Uh, it was like a week ago. Okay. They're, they made, <laughs> it was very they, recent. They've just made some changes, which honestly were almost completely in response to criticisms from the tech agencies. And, or tech agencies, that's probably more true than it should be. The tech oh. companies. Um, it's a little Freudian slip there. Um, but so, so taking it out of the safe harbor provision, which is boring lawyer gobbledygook, but really important. 
and putting in some of the other clarifications and the appeal rights and stuff. That's all been done in response to this ongoing conversation. So honestly, I don't, and not all of the senators are involved in this yet, just the people in, intimately involved in this part of the act. When it comes up before the whole Senate, there'll be a final draft. And so I, and most of the, the vast majority of the senators are not involved in this process yet. So, are, so being concerned about a specific provision in it, they're not going to be able to do anything whether they listen to you or not. I would save my letter until we know what they're going to read and what they're going to actually be deciding. So, Because it may look very different by then. Politically, kind of what we're worried about right now, um, because this has happened before and it happens a lot and unfortunately it's become the sort of default mode of lawmaking recently, is um, that controversial bills or bills, which this will stir up a lot of conversation, like this is just going to be one of those things that whether you think it's valid or not, people are going to be fighting like crazy over this. Yeah, this is the um, early stage, but this is the get... early stage. It's going to be, there's going to be tomato throwing. Um, the tendency is to try to slip it in an end of year spending package, to slip it into an omnibus bill, which then is a must pass, and then it gets sort of waved through. And we've seen this happen with, um, we saw this happen with uh, the Copyright Claims Board, uh, which was a very controversial bill that got slipped in at the last minute to an end of your spending package. This happened with felony streaming, which was actually, would have been super controversial. I, full disclosure, I was actually on the negotiating committee around the, the felony streaming act that got slipped in and it was actually fine, actually, um, weirdly from a consumer perspective. Um, so what we're concerned about is that the tendency of these laws, which again, Every time you add a layer of, of new copyright law onto the stack, there are going to be ripple effects throughout the entire digital ecosystem. That and is, some of them are good. Some of them are. Some of them may be good. Some of them may be not. But there are going to be ripples, and they are going to generally be pretty large and very far-reaching. Which, to my mind, says this is a conversation we need to be able to have in its own space, in its own time and not a thing that you should be jamming into an end of your spending package. Now that um, I'll agree on, but I still don't think that problems with the system are a reason never to act. But yeah, they should be actually debating these things, not throwing them in where no one's allowed to say so no. if your reps happen to be on any of the um, appropriations committees, please write them and let them know Tell this. them to quit putting them stop non appropriations this. into sub substantive stuff into those bills. That we can both agree stop on. This should it. be negotiated, this should be... The senator should have read this before they vote on it, but that's a yeah. way beyond copyright issue. That's absolutely everything they do. Mm -hmm. Hi, uh, yeah, I had a question about decentralized technology and how maybe the current law and this potential future law might affect that. And so I was just curious, do the current laws and the future law potentially, uh, do they target really just uh, single entities, corporations, things like that, or do they also apply to a decentralized technology like a torrent, where everything's really just distributed, there's no way to, to track it easily, so do you know, like, are the laws still the same, or is it just really hard for them to enforce, or are the laws actually different? The law's definitely the same, it's just a question of how easy it is to enforce. Um, this is, you know... Uh, if they can't find you, they can't enforce it. Yeah. And that's always been one of the tensions for even basic copyright law. That's the one that starts with Napster. Mm -hmm. um, each generation after the first Napster case, and the first Napster case was, you know, everyone talked about it, like, legally there's not an interesting issue there because that is so obviously infringement that there's not, I couldn't teach it in my copyright class because there was no issue. But then they said, well, what if we did it this way? They kept decentralizing as they got the technology to do this. Well, now there's no server. Well, now it's not this. And, we'll, and each time the lawsuits chased it, but they tried to, as they got more and more decentralized, it was harder and harder to apply it. And that was nine million years ago. So now obviously those issues are still around, but it's spades. I mean, it's gotten much more that's, so. That's sort of the key tension in digital copy right now is like how, it's, it's an enforcement Who question. <laughs> Who do you sue if it's, a, and if it's an avatar on a screen? Um, and that's why we have like all this tension around intermediary platform liability. It's like, well, I can't sue the guy who's uploading it, so the next best person is Twitter. Um, Twitter's got deep because pockets. Because Twitter has the money. Twitter has the money, and so I and so this is a tension we run into all the time, which is rights holders are you know, and especially small rights holders are screwed. They're getting screwed. 
and they look around and they're like, I gotta sue, so like, I need to get paid by somebody, and I can't this chase down stuff. this dude. Someone stole it from me. I need help to protect it I and to make a somehow. living. And and I, I need they're not on the table either. And that's, yeah, and it's, you know. It, but they benefit from actual application of the copyright law and expansion as needed for tech. So not every expansion is evil. This one, in, in particular, which is what we're really supposed to be focusing on here, I, in my mind, this one has one weakness, which is we're assuming the Library of Congress will make good decisions. I, that's a big stretch for me because I don't think that if unfettered government will ever make a good decision. I don't think it's the Library of Congress per se. I have the same problem with the IRS and the EPA and everyone out there making rules by people who aren't elected. Um, it's bad enough when people are elected. But in this case, the idea is honestly fairly straightforward. We passed this law a bazillion years ago. We're trying to fix a part of it that has never taken effect because it was just too weak and toothless. Is this the correct fix? I think it's a good approach. I don't like the Library of Congress getting to make its own decisions, because anytime you see the language of, oh, they will listen to the constituencies and take into account all of the arguments and say, oh, thank you for playing. Now I'm going to make my decision. Go on. And that, I think, is a weakness of it. But I think yeah. that it's overly broad to say, because there are problems in the system as a greater thing, and because not everybody in the government or the Copyright Office or God help us Congress understands technology, we should never act in that area, I think is a huge overreaction to it. Yeah. But this particular act, honestly, it's one of the few things I'll say this about. I think it's well-intentioned. Um, but if it's the right fix, I'd like to see them put a little stronger guidance for the Library of Congress rather than assuming they'll do what's right. That yeah, me. I mean, at the end of the day, like I, I know this is well. I know the staffer who wrote this act. Like he's a friend of mine. Um, I, he's very wrong about many things, uh, and I tell him this right. I probably like him. Um, but uh, yeah, at the end of the day, this is a risk assessment question. Like, what do you think the bigger risk is generally overall? I think the bigger risk is the this possible systemic consequences of getting this wrong. Um, and the way that this is structured, I think there's a higher risk of getting it wrong. Courtney comes in, and I, I'm going to put words in your mouth, but says, like, the greater risk is to not doing anything. Well, that um, risk exists now. It's not right. a potential downstream risk. But the, the, the problem they are trying to fix is a current problem. Mm -hmm. And I think that it's reasonable to want to take steps to cure a current problem rather than worry about, but what if the cure causes later problems? Well, okay, that's something that should be taken into account. You shouldn't just say, we have to fix this, so we're going to take an action whether it actually fixes it or not, whether it causes worse problems or not. No, I hate that. And Congress does it every day. We have to take action so we can tell the voters we did something. Of course, what we did was crap and made everything worse. You need to act intelligently and in a considered fashion, which honestly this act is trying to do in my mind. And I, there is an existing problem that it's trying to cure. You need to act with appreciation of potential downstream effects of it, which will be both positive and negative, try to minimize the negative effects, try to maximize the positive effects, but the fact that it's not perfect is not a reason not to do it. Right. The fact that it, the fact that there might be downstream effects, well, try to minimize them, but that's not, on balance, worse than the existing current problem. You yeah. have to, it's a balance, and that's never a justification to do nothing. And these people, like I said, since they just changed it substantially in response to some of the very criticisms she's been making, um, and it was from the tech industry because they have many of the same concerns about this. Mm. <laughs> Not all the same. It's a, uh, you know, it's a balance. The other context I'll put on this, and then I know we're out of time, um, is that this is not the only proposal that exists. This is not, like, the alternative to this is not doing nothing. There are ongoing discussions at the Copyright Office. They've been doing a year-long series of convenings to try to get everybody to talk about these things. We have been pushing for standard technical measures to include things like what I mentioned earlier with having reverse lookups and being able to have an API accessible thing so that basically any website that had uploaded content could reverse ping the Library of Congress database to figure out if something has a rights holder attached to it. So this is not, and I think this, this tends to be the problem is that there's no sexy bill out there that says that. 
Um, nothing with a good acronym. Definitely nothing with a good if acronym. If you don't have a good acronym, you might as well go home. So it's, it, is a, it is a very broad conversation. This is not the only part of it that is happening. And you know, part of what we're advocating for is we need to have this conversation. This is not the solution that comes out of it that we want. We, you know, but it is a result of that conversation. It is, a, it is part of that conversation. Cool. Thank you, everyone, for coming. Rate us five stars because you got to listen to us yell for an hour. We got um, up early too. If anybody has any other questions, I know we didn't get to everybody, but I'm, I'm hanging out here for a few minutes. So.